Yes, uh, well, we got the first slide going. Uh, my name is Fred Goldberg. I have a background from the Broad Institute of Technology. I'm a mechanical engineer, but uh, I've been doing everything else in the world but mechanical engineering since I graduated. And the last uh, four years, I found interest in on the climate issues and started to look at what the hell is going on here. And I found a lot of strange things and some interesting things. And uh, I do this for pure fun. Uh, Nobody is paying me. I don't have a prepaid opinion, which is important. Uh, I have often been asked to give lectures to Rotary clubs and schools and other organizations. And I used to start my lecture by asking, how many of you in the audience believe that humans have changed the climate? And uh, only two hands. Well, it looks like I can go home. I don't need to do my lecture here. <laughs> well, uh, I gave one lecture uh, at the Building Society in Stockholm, and there were 50 people there, and 25 raised their hands. And uh, I let you know afterwards what happened. OK, let's start the uh, uh, my lecture. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about carbon dioxide. And uh, let's start from the very beginning, four and a half a billion years ago. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere consisted then of 80% carbon dioxide, 10% water vapor, and 10% nitrogen. And uh, this mix of gases uh, created uh, um, uh, acids that uh, dissolved the silicates on the surface of the Earth, forming carbonates, and they collected up in the oceans, etc releasing oxygen and uh, producing more water. So today we have uh, another mix, 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and other gases, 1%, of which carbon dioxide is 0 0.038, something like that. If we go back in history, the geologists have been able to establish uh, what the temperature and carbon dioxide was uh, 100 million years ago and up to today. And we can see that 100 million years ago when the dinosaurs were roaming around, we had exactly 10 times more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the plants were flourishing, there was a rich plant life, of part of it is today in the oil we use, of course. And uh, we can also see uh, the history of temperature and carbon dioxide in some areas they coincide, in some areas they don't. Well, uh, to get an idea of uh, carbon dioxide uh, and its role in, on Earth, it is important to know some characteristics. One of the most important ones that are uh, seldom discussed is its solubility in water. And cold water dissolves more carbon dioxide than warm water, as you can see with this graph. I haven't been able to find a graph like this in the literature, so I had to make it myself. And uh, we can see that if uh, water is 5 centigrade, uh, we have 3 grams per liter uh, carbon dioxide uh, dissolved in it. And if we go up to 20 degrees, which is a normal summer temperature in our seas in Sweden, uh, we have only half as much carbon dioxide. Uh, when we produce mineral water, it is approximately 5 centigrade. And they just let carbon dioxide bubble through the water, and in a matter of seconds, it has absorbed the carbon dioxide. So it's a very fast process, uh, bringing carbon dioxide into the water. Uh, if we go to seawater, it's a different story. It dissolves 73 times more carbon dioxide than fresh water. And that's because we have a lot of minerals which is combining the carbon dioxide into carbonates. We have calcium, magnesium, boar, and many other minerals. And uh, this table shows clearly uh, that if we go uh, to 20 centigrade, the, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide is reduced to half in the water. Uh, there's a fairly complicated chemistry behind this that I will not go into any details. But you see here a couple of the formulas where you see the carbon dioxide 
uh, combining with water is creating different ions and carbonates and uh, these processes are reversible one way or the other and uh, we hear often that uh, there's an acidification of the oceans that is a very strong uh, 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 what do you say? Uh, it's a very strong exaggeration uh, it is impossible to change the uh, pH value of the oceans because we have infinite amount of buffers with these uh, car carbon, uh, carbonates. So in order to change the pH value of one step, all the carbonates in the oceans would have to be dissolved. And that's not possible. We don't have enough fuel to burn to create that. So we don't have to worry about the oceans changing. Uh, there are local variations, small ones, but that's it. Uh, we can also see that there is a large cycle of uh, carbon dioxide circling between the oceans and the atmosphere. And that's with the change of temperature in the waters, the currents, the winds, and also in the oceans. Uh, here we see um, a, s a set of data found in IPCC which I regard as fairly accurate. Uh, the oceans uh, release uh, 90 gigaton carbon a year and absorb 92. And the bio uh, vegetation, they release 101 and a half gigaton, but absorb the same amount. Uh, human emissions are today about eight gigatons. And in the oceans, we already have 38,100 gigatons of carbon compared to the atmosphere of 775. That is a ratio of 1 to 50, which is the same ratio you find in Henry's law between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in water. This graph shows also that there's a lot of reactions between carbon dioxide in the oceans and in uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton. And a Swedish specialist on oceanography, he claims that there's five times more biomass in the oceans than on land. And this biomass is consuming carbon dioxide too, releasing oxygen, which we need to breathe with. NASA made this uh, summary showing that uh, industry, agriculture, and land use produce 29 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide a year, while the natural forces are up to 772. Uh, this is an approximation, which I guess is fairly close. If we take these numbers, uh, 775 is the total amount in the atmosphere. The biomass uh, absorbs 110, and the seas 92. We see that those together make 25% of uh, all the carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere. That means that all the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is consumed in these processes in four to five years. Then uh, we see that uh, the human addition is eight. It's very insignificant and has no influence on the system. The human emissions are absorbed by nature in 16 days, the annual production of human beings. Uh, okay, now let's see how is the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere established. Uh, first, uh, we have seen this Vostok diagram, and uh, what we can see here is that when we have uh, a warm period, interglacial period, we also call it, we can see that the red line representing carbon dioxide is increasing when the temperature slowly goes down. Uh, the uh, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going down. That is because when we are heating the oceans, uh, the oceans release a lot of carbon dioxide, and when the oceans are cool, they absorb a lot of carbon dioxide. So the overall ocean temperature uh, decides the level of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. We often see this drastic diagram showing how rapidly the carbon dioxide has been increasing in the last century. Uh, and this is, of course, something that would scare the politicians and makes a good argument for IPCC. But uh, let's look at the truth here. Uh, this is the real diagram starting from zero on the left axis. It doesn't look that dramatic, does it? 
But even this, in my opinion, is a strong exaggeration. I believe that uh, the uh, pre-industrial level has never been 290, and that we always hear. Uh, it, uh, there is no pre-industrial level, in my opinion. But the average level in the last uh, 10,000 years is probably around 335. So taking that into consideration, if it back in the uh, we can see here that the real increase the last uh, 100 years is approximately 50 ppm, uh, which is due to the warming of the oceans. Okay. Uh, here we can see uh, the carbon dioxide measurements in northern Canada on Ellesmere Island. And there's a seasonal variation of 15 ppm, which is five times more than the human emissions. And this is, of course, because of the cooling and warming of the water in that area due to the seasonal variations. Another station is uh, Hawaii, Mauna Loa. You also see seasonal variations because the ocean around Hawaii is changing temperature also with the season, but it's only a 5 ppm variation, not so significant. And if we go down to the next, we see uh, the South Pole, there are no oceans around the South Pole very close, but uh, so there is hardly any seasonal variation, it's about very small. Uh, a year ago, I sat uh, browsing on the internet looking for data, and suddenly this list of numbers popped up that I found were interesting. Uh, this is the increase of carbon dioxide per year. And all the numbers are positive because there is a warming of the ocean during the last uh, 25 years. But uh, the, uh, the rate changes quite a bit. So uh, we can see that in 1991 and 92, we have the lowest increase of the period, which uh, seems a little bit strange because that was when we had the eruption of Pinatubo, which emitted a lot of carbon dioxide. So you would expect a higher number, but no, we had the lowest numbers. And of course, uh, the, res the reason is that uh, the eruption of Pinatubo is throwing out a lot of ash in the stratosphere, which has a cooling effect on the oceans, uh, absorbing or keeping more carbon dioxide instead of releasing it. And then in 98, it has the highest number, not unexpectedly, because we had a super El Nino heating the oceans, releasing more carbon dioxide than it normally would. So if we plot uh, the annual increase of CO2, uh, we have a curve like this, and, uh, if you, and then we can see that uh, almost every bend on the curve has a natural reason. We have the volcanic eruption of Mount St. Helens, which is not that visible because there was an El Nino at the same time. But then we have the Chu Mexican El Chichon in 82, we have the El Nino in 87, the Pinatubo 91, and Super El Nino 98, and La Nina again. So we see that uh, the bumps up and down have an explanation. Uh, here uh, I plotted uh, the temperature over the same period, but then I ran into the problem that uh, the official global temperature measurements seem to be strongly exaggerated. So I took the MSU data from satellites, which is the red line, and here we can see the difference and how much the, uh, the global temperatures uh, are exaggerated, almost 100% most years. So I discarded the, uh, the blue curve in my work, which I started with, put in the satellite data instead, which I think is much more reliable, and I added them to the CO2 curves, and we can see an astonishing uh, um, correlation between the two. Uh, but it is not astonishing, because it is, of course, that the temperature changes, uh, it changes the surface temperature of the oceans, controlling the amount of carbon dioxide going in and out. And we have made a statistical uh, uh, regression analysis of this, and we found a very strong significance uh, on this, of course. Next case. And we have P smaller than 0 0.0001. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, there are primarily uh, three factors controlling the CO2 level in the atmosphere, and, and that is due to the atmosphere-ocean surface equilibrium process. 
So the first, the main factor, is uh, related to the ocean general temperature, uh, which is changing with the uh, ice ages and so on. And uh, next, please. And this is the diagram I showed you. And the next one is the uh, seasonal changes of ocean water temperatures. We just saw, yes, please. That one. And then the third is natural events like volcanic eruption and aninos also having an effect. So all these three work together. And here we can see how the CO2 increase follows the troposphere temperatures. Uh, it follows fairly well, as you can see, over a longer period. So what about the human emissions? Uh, they are 1% of the amount of CO2 that is already in the atmosphere. And uh, considering that 25% of all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is absorbed by the biomass and the oceans, the human contribution is, of course, uh, insignificant. And uh, we, uh, uh, we also made a uh, multi-regression analysis of the human emissions compared to the changes in the atmosphere, and we found it very insignificant. Uh, what is interesting is that in 1991-92, as a result of the Pinatubo eruption, Earth cooled almost one degree centigrade. And uh, the increase in the atmosphere was 1.47 or 3 gigaton. But at the same time, we humans emitted 12 and a half gigaton carbon. So I asked Bert Pauline, uh, where did the 9.5 gigaton go? I met him a month before and he died. And he was not very willing to answer my question, but uh, he was nailed into the corner. So he agreed that it must have gone into the oceans. So I said that was a very good answer, but you have for 20 years told us that it takes 200 years for the human carbon dioxide to be absorbed. Now it takes only one year, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, he was quite shocked, I can tell you. Uh, this diagram shows the uh, annual changes uh, in the number of carbon, uh, gigaton carbon, the blue line, and the red line shows the result in the atmosphere. So visually we can see there's absolutely no correlation between the two. This is strangely enough an IPCC diagram. I don't understand why they put it in, because it counterdicts everything they say. We see the annual level of uh, emissions, uh, the, the black uh, step stones here, and the, the red line shows the change in the atmosphere. And if we look at 1973, when we had the first energy crisis, the emissions were constant for three years, but there was a drastic change uh, of CO2 in the atmosphere. So here we can also see very clearly there is no correlation between the two. Next, please. And the multi regression analysis that we did show that P is larger than 0.1. There is absolutely no correlation, which means that the human emissions have not put any tracks in the atmosphere. Well, then I want to discuss if there has been a pre-industrial carbon dioxide level. Uh, the man called Callender in the 30s decided to study this issue and he had, he had to his availability a lot of data that you see uh, on this diagram with all the dots uh, from the CO2 measurements made in history. But he decided that the only dots that are correct are the ones around 300. So he eliminated all the other data and went out and said that 290 ppm is the pre-industrial level. So that's an interesting invention. We can see from uh, stomata cell studies uh, made from uh, suga heterophylla plants uh, over 1,200 years that there has been big changes in carbon dioxide. And we can also see a trend connected to temperature changes with some time lag. Because the, um, there's a time lag between temperature change and ocean <coughs> circulation, adjusting the carbon dioxide but also the plants uh, in themselves have an adjustment time. But we can see here that there's a change of almost 100 ppm several times over the last thousand years. But the average value here comes out at around 335. And here's another diagram 
where they also superimposed the ice core values at 290. And the ice core people, uh, if they find a value apart from 290, it is discarded because it must be incorrect. Uh, here we can see uh, the ice cores at the bottom, uh, and we can see the, um, the stomata cell frequency converted to CO2 ppm. If you press the button, you can see that we're coming out of the ice age. So there's a rapid increase, and it seems to stabilize at around 314. This is 10,500 years ago. If we look at IPCC, uh, carbon dioxide hockey stick, uh, it is an interesting curve because uh, they have carbon dioxide measured in air bubbles in ice. But it takes at least 100 years to create an air bubble in the ice. But here they show, no, please uh, go back. So here they show that uh, they have measurements that is uh, from 100 to 50 years on from the ice, and the last 50 years is supposedly the Mauna Loa recordings. So this is an obvious incorrect, and that there is no valuable me measurements. And what happened was that they had a curve from the uh, cycle station uh, that was going straight up, and to make the history uh, come to place, they moved the whole curve 82 years according to Jaworowski, who is an expert in this area. And that is what IPCC is selling to us, this uh, scientific uh, fraud, so to say. And the reasons uh, that you cannot measure with any accuracy the CO2 levels in ice is that in any ice uh, air bubble in the ice, there is a thin liquid uh, surface which will absorb the carbon dioxide and the Carbon dioxide will also uh, diffuse into the ice in micro cracks, and you have no real control of what's happening with the CO2 after you've taken out the ice core uh, from the glacier. Uh, another study showed that the age of the ice core had a significant change of carbon dioxide in the air, etc. So, the critical question is Has human emissions caused global warming? Well, we can look at the historical diagrams. We see that there was a, a nice warming. I call it climate improvement from 1910 to 1940. And then we have a cooling period. At the same time, we had a very big uh, increase of CO2. Uh, next, please. And of course, the, the uh, interpretation of this was that the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere caused the cooling. And we were heading for a new ice age. And then suddenly it changed again. And the argument is that the temperature increase is increasing more rapid than any time else in history. And the only explanation for that must be uh, human uh, emissions. Uh, I was attending a conference, and uh, one of the leading persons from uh, the Swedish uh, environmental office said so. And I replied that if you express something like that, it proves that you don't have enough knowledge, and he turned red, red in his face. Uh, here we see um, the, um, temp uh, the red curve is satellite measurements of temperature, and uh, the dark line shows the slowly increasing CO2 level. And it is because of the oceans are still releasing warm water at the surface, which in turn releases carbon dioxide. We can also see that there is no real temperature increase the last six, seven years. And uh, if we look at the next slide here, we can see that the human emissions, uh, next please, uh, have been 200 billion tons of carbon dioxide the last eight years. Uh, but there's been no temperature increase during the same time. So where is the correlation? Uh, now Another important correlation is uh, the fact that uh, the um, uh, greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide uh, is uh, logarithmically decreasing as this curve shows. So if we double uh, the carbon dioxide from 290, excuse, 
industries, uh, we see that the increase of temperature is minor, 1.2 centigrade. But uh, it is not, there's, there's not enough carbon dioxide to produce. If we burn all our coal reserves and oil reserves, there is not enough uh, to raise the level in the atmosphere because 98% of it is always being absorbed in the oceans. So this cannot happen. But of course, uh, IPCC, they have another theory that if we increase carbon dioxide, the uh, temperatures will soar. But uh, if you have seen the last temperature report from the last year, next please, uh, temperature has dropped uh, 0.63 on average, uh, which is almost as much as 100 years of warming. So the next coming months will be very interesting to see uh, what is going to happen and what the arguments will be from IPCC. But uh, there's a theory that we are soon going into a new little ice age. The governments should be more concerned about this and prepare for bad harvest, famine, and other natural disasters because of cooling, not because of warming. And uh, next, please. Uh, next one, please. There. There are plot of the last year's temperature change, which contradicts IPCC very strongly, of course. And uh, so if the green activists and eco-fundamentalists have their wishes fulfilled, this is where we will end up. Next picture, please. Something is not right. Our air is clean, our water is pure, we all get plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet nobody lives past 30. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time.